I, I wanted to touch too on on calling uh, Marxism right wing. Uh, the oh. the the thing about historical materialism uh, sort of being, you know, right wing at least that sounds right to me um, because it, it is the kind of thing you'd hear from conservatives, right? I mean, you you'd um, you know the there's there's this thing by Mark Fisher, right? Capitalist realism, where you think that there's just nothing you can do, right? Um, you you hear the the kind of you know, oh, well, there's huge inequalities and people are dying on the street. I don't know, what do you want us to do about it, right? There's nothing to be done. And that's kind of what we get here, right? It's it, We get this story about how you can't do anything until you have this kind of material superabundance and then you achieve socialism. And in the time, it's like, well, yeah, look, we hate capitalism, but what do you want us to do about it? You know, there's just, you know, you're, you're stuck with that kind of fatalism there. Mm -hmm. I mean, his own uh, description of how um, the Marxist will interpret uh, colonialism is so much, you know, like what, you know, anybody on the right would have said, no? So uh, at the time of where Spain, for example, went to America, it was about 48 million or something in Europe and maybe as many as 90 million uh, in America. and which of course were, you know, disappeared with all of the uh, many diseases that we transmitted and the wars and so on. And it was an ecological catastrophe as well. And that is the sort of thing that I had in mind, you know, uh, a genocide, uh, environmental disaster, you know, accounts of uh, sort of horses passing by and smashing all their crops because there's like a, a plague of horses, like, you know, a catastrophe of, you know, uh, in massive scale. Their description is, well, um, we have, we are the torch carriers, we have the, the just system, the, the best institutions for the development of the productive forces, capitalism. So we go to these, uh, to these countries, we give them these uh, uh, new structures, and then they all flourish, all of them, all of them, like as if there's resources, there are resources for everybody to repeat exactly the same, use the same CO2, use the coal that you use, use the oil that you use, you know, with this assumption that, you know, there's going to be enough for everyone and they follow the same, the same pattern. And then one of them eventually becomes the torch carrier as they, some of them sort of get worn out and then another one. And that's how humanity develops in this in this way it's like <laughs> always positive always like focusing on the sort of beneficial aspect on the technological aspect and and not um, uh, on the other things no in, even for example this idea that you were all technological inventions would would come from the torch carriers and would benefit the uh, people in developing countries well if those technologies are um, invented by people who have a lot of money, a lot of resources, uh, certain needs, they're going to be a certain type of technology. Why do you assume that it will suit another one that is poor, doesn't have those resources to operate the machine and has also very different environment and, and, uh, and very different needs? No? I mean, there would be things that, of course, would be useful for, for everybody, and that is how um, humanity has developed, no? is the, the, um, the tendency for people to want to spread their know-how that has um, helped humanity. No? That's, for example, the, um, the Secret of Our Success, a book by uh, Joseph, that uh, um, has this, this view. No? And even before, I mean, the people like um, Ralph Linton, who wrote about the turn of the century, he was one of the people who challenged the idea of Marxism um, representing societal development very much like children develop. No? So they have an endogenous tendency to grow and they're going to grow, but they can grow more or less depending on the structures they, they adopt, but everybody does independently. And then there's been um, a lot of people who said, no, you know, look, there are parts of a, of a planet that don't even have a Bronze Age because like they found somebody in the desert and they helped them and they said, thank you very much for saving my life. Now I'm going to show you a trick. And they showed them how to work with iron so that they didn't have to practice with bronze 
sufficiently to then move into the uh, Iron Age, they could jump directly. And that's why now the archaeological remains so that some part of humanity skip the bronze. Not everybody went to stone, bronze, iron. No, some people were able to skip it. And in fact, uh, Linton comes to the conclusion that 90% of the elements that you find in any society have been imported from other societies, somebody who passed by. And that's why societies that are open and welcome immigrants they tend to get more ideas and they develop faster. And those that are, you know, close uh, to themselves, they, they don't. So with this idea of technological transmission, they could have told us some other um, story that sounds like, you know, that has different political implications. Like, you know, let's be open. Let's talk to people from different cultures. Let's see what we can learn from each other and so on. But no, the, the whole thing is on, we need to control and dominate so that we can conquer others so that eventually they would have, you know, our structures that are superior and our technology that is superior and so on. So, I mean, to me, that sounded like a very conservative spin on the issue of sort of technological transfers. And it's like the most conservative story that you can tell about technological transmission. And uh, to, to clarify that quickly, uh, the, the reason that's sort of tied here to, um, you know, the, the historical materialism is because they, they have this thing where they think that it's not even just, uh, you know, like the machine gun example or whatever, um, even, even ideologies to them are, are tied to this production thing. So the story here is, is going to be tied to, um, you know, about colonialism and stuff. The story is going to have to be that that's somehow pushing production forward. Uh, so that's that's how we end up here, thinking that it's actually very, very conservative. Yeah, and also um, this view that an ideology is only a side effect of whatever is the superior structures, then you will develop the ideology that comes up with it. And so you don't never have to worry about ideology as such. But that is just not true. I mean, I, for example, when I live in Oxford, I was friends with lots of people working on um, technology for, for Africa, like intermediate technology in the Schumacher society and so on. And many of the, the problems that they encountered were ideological. For example, they invented um, a machine to for grinding because um, so we don't have women, we don't have a lot of strength in our arms, but the, with the legs, if you give us a bicycle, we can grind uh, quite quickly and turn it into flowers so we don't have to travel to the city and pay somebody to, to grind for us. So they made this system with uh, recycling old bicycles that, you know, you could just use the mechanism to, you know, produce all the flour from your grain that, that, uh, that you want. And then it turns out that there was a taboo for women to ride bicycles. And also there was a taboo for men dealing with the grain because there was some cultural association of the grain and with fertility, with women, with the land, blah, blah, blah. So they had made this fabulous invention. And because of this combination, it couldn't uh, work out. And for a Marxist, that could never happen because the ideology always is always there to oil the machinery and for everything to go smoothly. And they don't anticipate that sometimes there are some ideologies that are terrible. I mean, um, last year I had, um, uh, in, as a student, uh, uh, Otto Odonga, who is now trying to become the next uh, prime minister of uh, Uganda. And uh, of course, uh, his stories and, the, and his own ideology and his, is so um, extremely bad for Uganda. You know, obsession with population growth, uh, the value of a man depends on you know, how many children he has, um, horrible attitude towards uh, gay people. I mean, whole population is one of the big problems of Africa. It is. And the ideology that people have is really bad for one of their major problems. It, it uh, you know, it's just not, I, I'm not saying that it's just a matter of changing their ideology. Of course, there are lots of things that can be done. For example, you know, um, uh, years of education is very strongly correlated to number of children you have. So the more you educate women, the more they would. So there's something non-ideological, which is increase the years of schooling for women that you can do in Africa to 
to get this problem. But the idea that the ideology that they have, this obsession with reproduction, is you know, optimal for the development of Africa it is completely crazy. So you should not go around spreading this view that people have the ideologies they have because that is optimal for their growth, because very often people have ideologies that are very bad for them. I, yeah, um, I did sort of wonder too, um, because Co Cohen's theory is sort of strong in a lot of ways. I was sort of wondering what you thought about maybe a, a sufficiently moderate theory, you know, like maybe you just sort of um, strip back the bits here that are kind of too strong, right? Like maybe you just say that um, certain ideologies are, are going to be there for pushing production forward or uh, or whatever, you know, I, I sort of wonder where, where you think it gets left off if you just sort of, I don't know, weaken the theory a lot. But one of the problems with the theory is already that it is a little bit on the edge of a theory that you cannot refute. And that is the worst thing that a theory can have. A theory must be always explained very clearly and with the conditions of refutation spelled out so that if such and such happens, that means the theory is false. No, such and such happens, it means the theory is false. We, you know, we can't trust a theory as a serious theory if there isn't something that would be obviously, um, you know, able to lead us to abandon the theory. No. So the more you sort of weaken it and the more you sort of so on and say, well, maybe uh, the bad theories will eventually be abandoned after the centuries or, you know, the more you go in this direction, then the more you would be intensifying that problem with a theory that doesn't have very clear conditions of uh, falsifiability. And in fact, right. that was one also one of the things that ended up uh, worrying him that he wasn't in, you know, towards the very end, he wasn't sure whether the theory was true or whether we have a way of finding out if it's true or not. Because, you know, there's so many stories that we can tell about potential counterexamples. But then when you have a theory and like psychoanalysis, where you can always come up with something and then you can never refute it, then that is not a theory. And, and that's like worse. That's that's even worse than being right wing, maybe. It is, uh, you know, it's not a theory. So you can only weaken it so much, you know, before it becomes like, oh, well, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And then it's undistinguishable from sort of some vague generalization everyone one can make, but it's not a proper theory anymore. You no, know? and I certainly can make predictions. And, because it says things will change. I mean, there are maybe there are some very ge general things that uh, that one can say. You no, know? so for example, maybe now that um, it is becoming increasingly clear that we cannot all eat meat and continue with this, you know, level of consumption that that we have, and for the planet to be able to put up with it, then more and more people are like stop flying, stop eating meat, and so on. So there is some correlation between ideologies and uh, the needs of survival. But you see that, you know, it's only 1% of the a, of a planet is vegan, no? And, and what we need is a lot more than that. So there's such a big mismatch that, you know, I, I, to say that uh, the theory speaks of a correspondence, but the correspondence is so very vague and it can take so many years for people to adjust to whatever is required that then, you know, you can, if you, if you soften it too much, it just becomes like too much of a blur and a sort of general vision, but not really a proper theory. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned too, that he was sort of worried about that. He, um, I, I want to talk about some of the things he was worried about, too, because it, it seems really clear if you read his stuff uh, post writing this book, he was worried about a lot of it. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I read his book, Self-Ownership, Freedom and Equality, and there's a chapter in there called Against the Marxist Technological Fix, where he, he points out like this exact same thing. Where he's like, um, you know, Marxists just kind of want to sit around and wait for socialism and 
Um, you know, there's nothing to be done in the meantime. But Cullen was was super concerned with distributive justice himself. He's like, um, he he wanted to argue against that. And he wanted to say uh, that actually we could do a lot, right? And his his solution was that we could implement an egalitarian ethos and um, you know make a lot of progress that way. But it's like it seems it seems like he had a lot of doubts himself pretty early even after writing this book, you know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, when I first arrived, he he made a little fun of me, you know, but but I was like a very typical uh, greenie with my tangerines and uh, my vegetarianism and so on. And he used to make fun of me all the time, uh, which, you know, I, I I laugh at his joke. He was really very funny. I had a great time. Every time we had tutorial, it was a fantastic uh, time for me. But uh, uh, all the time, whenever something came on the news, because a concern for the environment went from zero to like really being taken more and more seriously all the time, he became uh, more and more concerned. And then he ended up uh, bringing to me some books he had. It's incredible how he got hold of them, but they were all Soviet books and old textbooks, and they were hilarious. They were like uh, very earnest, but they were hilarious. They were uh, things like, um, and people would be able to live uh, 250 years on average, and we will be able to move the clouds at will, and we would be able to control the weather uh, depending on what is beneficial for the crops. And it was like uh, a degree of technological optimism that, that you know, then when things started to come up on the, on the newspapers about how serious it was first acid rain and then the ozone and then climate change and so on, then it became, um, he became more and more concerned. But the other thing, and that is really what make I think the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, philosophical um, uh, change, was his concern with the individual. No, this idea that uh, so what do you do if you're a Marxist? Well, you don't do anything. You just sit back and see history unfold, and you'll see that you know feudalism turns into capitalism, and then capitalism self destroys. And you, you shouldn't really interfere because uh, if you intervene too early, then you can bring about socialism prematurely, like in Russia, and then it's a disaster because they weren't ready for it. And that's the reason they tried to do it too quickly because they heard about the theory and they tried to move too fast. So you shouldn't do it. All you can do is assist with the birth banks. That was the phrase. No, So once socialism uh, is already um, going to be born by its own you know internal um, causes not because of what you've done then you can help uh, assist in the in the birth so that is uh, less painful or something but really that that you're an spectator no? and that was very troubling for him so how what is it, how is this a left-wing message to tell people sit sit at home watch TV and, uh, and history will unfold and will de develop uh, and deliver all the desirable uh, things. Uh, so he started to talk about the uh, concern for the individual and that's how he went into his critique of, uh, of roles because when, when he changed sides, abandoned Marxism and moved to ro uh, started to study roles and everything, he found that there was a lot of similarities. So there was again a, a, a focus on the basic structure, on the law, on the major institutions of society and the individual. There wasn't uh, a job for the individual to do. There was no personal ethos. There was no sort of things that you should do if you become convinced of the theory and you want to arrive at the roles in society. What did you do as a person? Did you go to vote? But yes, in between voting, what did you do? No, And that is what led him to start his critique of roles. It was the same concern that led him to abandon Marxism, that led him to be a, maybe the most important um, critic of roles from the left. 